Here's part eight of the cipher. So they got out of the storage room. Nick didn't remember what else had happened because he woke up hugging the toilet, violently hung over. Nakoda was standing over him and she's just like, Randy told me you melted his sculpture. The melting point of steel is 3000 degrees. What are you doing? And Nick is just like, I gotta get out of here for a couple days. So he calls up some old gal pal of his that he hasn't talked to in three years, and they met through a really obscure way, and, you know, it was one of those things where she's like, if you need anything, you just call me. And he's like, I have nobody else. Nora, hey! Listen, I hear you have, like, a cabin you said you have. It's the middle of winter, and... I've, I've hit a really rough patch. Is there a chance that I could stay at your place for a couple days? And Nora, who hasn't heard anything from Nick in years, is like, Hey, Nick? Oh, Nick! Yeah, hi. He, I mean, weird request, and sure, you know what? Yeah. It was about time I owed a friend a favor. Come by, here's my address. I'm actually leaving this weekend for a ski trip, so it, you'll have your place, you know, have my my place all to yourself, so food's in the fridge and whatever, just come by. So Nick didn't even wait a minute. He packed up some of his stuff and he headed over to Nora's, which was like a three hour drive. He didn't tell Nakoda where he was going. He's just like, yeah, bye bye. Heads out. It's the middle of winter. It's cold. There's snow everywhere. The drive was pretty nice. He drove there in silence, thinking to himself. And when he got to Nora's place, you know, visibly, she was confused and wanted to know why Nick suddenly popped up out of nowhere and wanted to stay at her place. Kind of weird, not gonna lie. So she brought him inside, you know, made him a little hot cup of coffee. They sat down at her table before she left for her skiing trip with her gal pals. And she's like, hey, Nick, how you doing? Uh, why are you here? Hey, Nora. So, yeah audible lie oh baby yeah me and nakoda had a big fight ugh nakoda you're still seeing nakoda ugh so nora knew about nakoda ages ago and she loathes nakoda hates her guts and you know oh my gosh nick you stay here for as long as you want that fuming biatch is no good and I can't believe you're still around her well take your time I'm gonna head out there's food in the fridge there's a bed made upstairs for you or you can sleep on the couch honestly I don't care um you do you have fun crazy little kid and of course Nora before she left she notices the deep thick wrap of bandages on Nick's hand didn't ask too much about it but you know she stared at it for a bit and she's like what what happened to your hand and he's like oh I got in a got a bad bike accident really scraped up my hand she's like oh that's too bad and then she left soon after that of course. so nick was there for three days the only thing he did was he laid on the bathroom floor for the three straight days he only moved when he needed to to you know grab some booze and um i mean use the bathroom he was really depressed he was thinking about just his life and what he was going to do and you know, man, this this fun hole is ripping my life apart. What am I going to do? So on the third night, he fell asleep on the floor yet again, and he had some pretty gnarly dreams about the fun hole, you know, possessing him and you know, pretty much consuming him from the inside out. It was pretty gnarly. He woke up in a sweat, and he knew what he needed to do. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to be in a better mood today. We're, we're going to get some stuff done. So he called his job. And he quit immediately, which was insane because his boss was like, oh, you know, great timing because we were going to tell you you're fired. Haha, <laughs> what a quinky dink. Anyway, your last paycheck is in the mail. Um, been a pleasure, fam, but please don't ever come back. Then he went downstairs, grabbed his first thing. To eat. It's been three days. He hasn't eaten at all. So he stuffed his mouth full of stale Cheerios. And then he went looking around the house for Nora's 22 long rifle. And um, he loaded it, sat on Nora's bed, and he thought, man, this is going to be kind of shitty for him to come home to. Um, he was about to end his life. He sat there for a minute, and an over 
An overwhelming sense of calm washed over him. He no longer felt shame or guilt or fear. He sat on the bed for a good 20 minutes holding what could be the tool to end his life. And he thought about things. And then he did feel a bit guilty about, you know, doing it right there. And then Nora coming home to his deceased body. And then he's like, you know what? No, not right now. Not Now is not the time. So he unloaded it, put it away, went downstairs, cleaned up after himself, packed up his stuff, left Nora a, a note that said, thanks for letting me stay. I really appreciate it. Sorry I couldn't hang out until you got back, but I got stuff to do. And then immediately he started driving home. This was the 90s, so we stopped off at a payphone, called Nakoda, and she's like, where have you been? And he's like, that's none of your business. Meet me at my apartment in three hours. And then he hung up. He made it home in two hours, cleaned up everything, threw away pretty much most of his belongings, and then Nakoda came over.